today. Uh, I'm Connie Vanita Dow, Dean of Libraries here at Vanderbilt, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Ann Cook Calhoun, who uh, will introduce our speaker. And Ann is a true library patron. She, uh, she really is. She's done her time, actually. She's been president and vice president of Friends of the Library twice, and she now serves as the president of the Hearn Society, which is the library's uh, highest donor society. So we are certainly in her debt for many reasons. Vanderbilt's in her debt because she has uh, served as a brilliant professor of English, and uh, she is internationally known as an authority on Shakespeare. And I could spend the whole day introducing Anne, but I'm not supposed to do that, I understand. <laughs> but Anne, we thank you so much for your role in the event today and for your continued support. If you look around the room and you see a few of us who seem a bit overdressed for this event, <laughs> let me assure you that um, Early this morning, Nashville time, very early, we hopped on our, our jet and, and made post haste over here, landing uh, just in time. Of course, we've been to the royal wedding. <laughs> so please, please, if we, if we look a, a little sleepy and tired, uh, but, but nonetheless friendly, it's because we've just come from the event. Um, at the end of World War I, a group of gentlemen in England thought that they really ought to continue the strong ties that bound their allies in that, that great conflagration, that war to end all wars. Uh, among their number was a man named Winston Churchill. And they set out to establish an organization that would strengthen the bonds among uh, the English speakers in the Commonwealth and in the United States. The result was an organization called the English Speaking Union. It never was, never has been, and never will be an English only or an English first <laughs> uh, organization. Uh, at first, it was restricted to the United States and to uh, members of the Commonwealth, but in recent years, as English has spread to become the common language of science, politics, and business, uh, more than 50 countries that have English speakers who cherish uh, English-speaking traditions have formed branches of the English-speaking union. We just launched, and Pat can tell you about this if you ask her, we just launched a branch of the English Speaking Union in Albania. And in June, there's going to be one launched in Iceland. And you'd probably be surprised to learn that the largest branch in the world of the English Speaking Union is in St. Petersburg. Two years ago, I was involved in a search for the national chair of the English Speaking Union. Now, that's a hard job to fill because there are so many distinguished predecessors, including President Taft, including Kingman Brewster, who was president of Yale University, and including uh, the only other woman who has ever held that position, Anne Armstrong, who was ambassador to the court of St. James. Fortunately, we found Pat Schroeder. As you all know, she has had a distinguished career, 12 unbroken years in, con in Congress in the House of Representatives, the first woman who was ever seriously mentioned as a presidential candidate. Her career has focused on issues like families, education, the preservation of free speech, uh, the right of people who create books and, and other intellectual uh, and artistic properties to the proceeds and the rights of, the, of those properties. Uh, when she left Congress, she went to Princeton, so she knows what it is to be 
a, a professor at a prestigious university. Grounds like these are not unfamiliar to her. Uh, right just before she came to the English Speaking Union, she was president and CEO of the Association of American Publishers. And while this includes all of the major publishing in the United States, it's, it has a huge preponderance of people who create the books that we use in our schools and universities. She is a woman who cares passionately about civil discourse. She cares, she cares passionately about clear and courageous communication. And she cares about the value of English throughout the world to promote education, scholarship, and understanding, ESU. I give you Patricia Schroeder. Thanks so much, Anne. And thank you, Dean, and thank all of you. I am absolutely amazed on a Friday afternoon, as beautiful as this, there's anyone in this room. Um, so thank you all for being here. I must also say, for those of you um, who are tied to the library, one of the other things the English Speaking Union does is we have the Ambassador Book Awards every year. And as you well know, um, all of these different groups around, around the world love getting these books because what they are is professors decide what are the best books in six different genres and then we send them to the different uh, branches around the world and they're very, very appreciative because anymore we don't have the U.S. information libraries overseas so we're kind of trying to build up their own and it's a wonderful way for people to understand what's going on in our culture Although I must say there are days when I don't understand what's going on in our culture. But <laughs> nevertheless, here I am, and what do we talk about on Friday afternoon? You're very lucky because here is a, uh, well, maybe you're not so lucky. Here is a politician in the 12-step recovery politician program. Uh, and to give them a mic and a light, you never know what they're going to do. Um, I always love the same Blas Islands where the women control and they don't allow any politician to speak longer than they can stand on one foot. But luckily, that hasn't been adopted yet, so I'm, I'm safe. Um, and I thought what I'd do is just talk a little bit, and then let's open it up and let's have some discussion, because a lot of you may have lots of questions about other things, and I'm perfectly happy to discuss anything. If I don't know, I will tell you I don't know. I've had a, kind of an interesting life in that it really reflects the time we went through. I was born in Portland, Oregon in 1940. My father owned the airport. It was before they had municipal airports. <laughs> and when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, they um, nationalized my father's airport and called him up to teach flying for the then Army Air Corps. So we were moved all over the country. He almost got court-martialed for writing a book called Aerodynamics for Morons. Uh, because the guys who were head of the Army Air Corps didn't know how to fly. And what they did is they had taken the Navy navigation and told him that they had to use the Navy navigation manual, so you were going to tell pilots to take shootings on stars to figure out where they were. And he figured this was not going to be a good way. <laughs> this was not how pilots wanted to do it. Um, when the war was over, we ended up in Dallas, Texas. And my dad decided to go into aviation insurance. So we lived in Texas for a while, and then we went to Ohio for a while. I mean, there's no federal form where I can fill in all the places. I look like I was a migrant worker. Then um, he decided to form his own company in Des Moines, Iowa, where I graduated from uh, school, but I, high school. But I figured that this was good. I mean, this looked good for running for president, because I have a toe in so many different states. Um, and then I went to the University of Minnesota, because my father said the most important thing I learned in school was to support myself. And I went, oh, well, <laughs> luckily I had a pilot's license. And the University of Minnesota, I, I will always respect the Scandinavians because at that time they had an ROTC program with champion aircraft. I don't know if any of you fly, but it's a little, you know, and you have a stick and all this stuff. Well, somehow the federal government put those there 
but it was for obviously only people in the ROTC, and that was only males at that time. So I talked to the school, and they said, well, you know, it says only males, but it doesn't say we can't rent them to you. How about $10 an hour? I said, bingo. So I got a job adjusting aviation losses when I was in at the University of Minnesota and worked my way through in three years and made so much money the first year I was able to buy a Lincoln convertible and I went home and my father was really worried about what in the world I was doing at school to make so much money. <laughs> uh, but what had happened is this place had had, I don't know how many, how many uh, wrecks up in Alaska so I could fly up the Alcan Highway stay in little Omni stations for a dollar a night as guests of the Queen. So I've been fond of the Queen for keeping those places. Uh, <laughs> and then come back for class. So anyway, then I ended up at Harvard Law School, uh, where uh, I, was, uh, I, I was an absolute shock. I had gone to public school all my life. I'd come out of the Midwest and the West. I got to Harvard Law School, and almost everybody there had been in a sex-degraded school their entire life. And even the women, there were 15 women in my class, and one of them was Elizabeth Dole. And bless her little heart, she kept saying, I just don't know how you can be a lady and a lawyer. Well, <laughs> you know, coming from the West, I kept thinking, well, didn't you think about this before you took the LSAT? I mean, you know. <laughs> um, and finally, the school got very tired of it and said, okay, Elizabeth, you go work in the law library. We'll give you one more year to use your thing and, and try and work this out, will you? <laughs> so she ended up being in a class a uh, year behind me. But uh, the, here we all were, and um, most of the women had gone to sex at school. And they were totally freaking out because they were with men. I mean, they were like, oh my gosh, I have a date. My socks ran and I don't know what to do. And I'd say, there's a drugstore across the street. You walk over there and they sell nylons. You know, and guess what? Or borrow some, you know. So it was a real cultural experience for me. I came into class the first day and we had assigned seats, which we had never had at the University of Minnesota. And the gentleman on both sides of me stood up and said, we have never sat next to a woman in our entire educational career and we are not going to now. And I thought, wow, you know, <laughs> what is this estrogen poisoning? <laughs> I mean, so, um, and we had one professor, our property professor, who was so angry that we had gotten into the school that uh, uh, he had what they call ladies' day and we never knew when the ladies day would be. There were four of us in the class, and on ladies day we had to sit in front facing our colleagues and they could ask us any questions. And he would just rage about how awful it was because letting that many women in meant they had to build so many more restrooms and that took volumes out of the Harvard Law Library. You know how hard up they are at Harvard. So that was an experience, and then there was our wonderful dean, Dean Erwin Griswold, who was then actually chairman of the Civil Rights Commission. So he really understood the black-white issues, but he didn't get the women's issues at all. Um, and he had also voted against letting women in, but obviously had been overruled. So he invited my whole class over for dinner when we came as freshmen. I will never forget the dinner. First of all, it was sparkling Catalva juice, lima beans, and stewed chicken. And then when that was over, we thought, well, they really went out of their way. Um, they put little folding chairs in a circle, and he said, we're gonna go around the room, and I wanna know why each of you came here. He said, I just, I want you to know we let you in on the same basis we did men, but then I counted how many of you there were, and we let in that many more men, because I just can't imagine you're going to use the degrees. I was like, well, thank you, Dean. So everybody now was sitting there, you know, white knuckled, holding onto their chair, trying to think, what in the world am I going to say about why I'm here to impress the Dean? And we got to this wonderful woman in my class from Pasadena, California, it was probably the most important education I had in my three years at Harvard. She looked him straight in the eye and she said, you know, Dean, I'm here because I couldn't get in at Yale. <laughs> and he went, well, listen, 
He went totally ballistic. That, no, tell me more about that. I've never heard of that. Yale's always said, oh my gosh, it was wonderful. And the dinner was over, and I thought, that's how you do it. You gotta have a little humor, and you gotta know how to punch back. And she, and by golly, she did. So uh, then when I, we were married, and my husband was from Chicago, we decided we didn't want to go to Chicago, we didn't want to go to Des Moines, so we'd just go to Denver. <laughs> like so many people, and out to Denver we went. Um, and uh, the next thing you know, I was running for office, which was the craziest thing. My parents had gone off to Thailand on one of these people-to-people -people programs, and they had since moved to Denver, because my brother had moved to Denver, and they finally decided to follow us. Three weeks after they were gone, they came back, and they got off the plane, and everybody was there because their daughter had announced for Congress, and my mother was like, I will never leave town again. <laughs> you did what? Yeah. <laughs> and everybody assured me I wouldn't win. It was, Jim was in this amazing law firm. Did anybody see Secretariat? Okay, well, Dick, uh, Tweedy was my husband's senior partner, and Penny Tweedy was his wife. We were very good friends. Penny Tweedy inherits this horse farm, and Secretariat left out Reva Ridge, that won first. And then, of course, here comes Secretariat, and she finally says to him, I'm winning more races and making more money than you ever dreamed of, so, you know, we're going to Virginia, or I'm out of here. I can't do this commute. So he left the firm, uh, Jim's senior partner had run against an incumbent Republican that was in the Senate that nobody ever thought could ever be defeated, who was a chairman and everything else. He won, and then I won. So the whole law firm blew up. <laughs> between races, horse races, political races, and as Tweedy used to say, the difference between a horse race and a political race is in the horse race, the whole horse runs. But nevertheless. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, that, that was great fun, and um, 24 years later, I finally decided that was enough of that. But again, that was an amazing experience. Um, when I was a freshman, they clearly didn't know what to do with me. Uh, Anne was telling me that her congressman was a wonderful, wonderful Speaker of the House, Carl Albert. And when I got there, he kept trying to swear my husband in, and he kept saying, no, it's her, it's her. And just no one would ever believe it was me and not him. And he'd say, well, nothing's wrong with you. And why didn't you run? Poor dear man, he took so much crap. But uh, um, we got through all of that. And they gave me this silly little committee on commemorative days and holidays, and you know, I guess they figured, yeah, okay, well, we have a woman and we should do something with her. So they gave me this committee. And I passed out all of this stuff because it was coming onto the bicentennial, 17, or 1976. And they were getting ready. And all these things that I had done, I didn't think were at all controversial. They just seemed totally logical to me. Well, nobody paid much attention in the house. I'd go before and they'd think, isn't she cute? Most of them would go to their room and then vote for it. They had no idea what they were voting for. They didn't bother to even read it. It's another commemorative day. You know, are we celebrating pickles or what are we celebrating today? Well, the Senate did read them and we weren't getting things to the Senate. Suddenly I get an invitation from Catherine Graham to a dinner party at her house with Jackie Kennedy Onassis. Well, I think I'm probably now the most important person in Washington, D.C., you know. Wow, I'm going to Catherine Graham's house with Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, woo-hoo. So off I go, here we are, we're sitting at this table, and the other guests were United States senators who had said no to all the things that I had put through, but the main thing that they were really concerned about was a book called Remember the Ladies. It had been edited by Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, and it was an amazing book. Remember the ladies came from Abigail Adams, as you know, writing to John. Um, it was an amazing book about colonial women, all the stuff we never knew. I think one of the most amazing pieces was how Martha Washington spent all winters with the Continental Army. 
And George, after it was over, went to the Congress and insisted they pay her for it, because he said if she hadn't shown up, <laughs> the whole army would have defected. But how can you defect when this gray-haired woman comes riding in on a horse? <laughs> She'd look like a wimp. So um, all of these things, there's a whole series of things in there. And I just, uh, she, they wanted it to be part of the official bicentennial, and these senators were like, no way. And I'm sitting at the table thinking, what am I doing in this town? They are saying no to the two most powerful women I know in the city. And they kept saying no. They kept saying, our vision for bicentennial projects for women is beautification projects. And we said, great, you know what? We can do both. <laughs> Try us. We can beautify, and we can also read the book. Guess what? Well, they wouldn't have any part of it. So finally, their great compromise was the book would go into the US information libraries overseas as part of the bicentennial, but they would not be allowed in the US. And then, of course, four years later, <laughs> those libraries were closed. So anyway, that's when I thought, well, you know, maybe women aren't supposed to be here either. This is a little tough. They're not really welcoming if they're, if they're doing that. And of course, my other great story that many of you probably heard too many times, I wanted to be on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, there were no women. There were no blacks. Uh, Ron Dellums from Oakland also wanted to be on the committee. And for the first time in the history of the Congress, the Democratic Caucus overruled the chairman's veto. The chairman always had a right to veto anybody that came on. So the chairman then was F. Eddie Abair from Nolens, Louisiana. And he was enraged. We went into our first meeting feeling very proud, Ron and I. And we came in, and literally the guy was, it was like chairman, and there's no reason to be chairman anymore. They've taken away all the power. This is terrible. I can't imagine you know, how it could get any worse. And the one thing I can still do is determine how many seats are at the dais and these two people are only worth half of the rest of you, so they get one chair. <laughs> so Ron and I sat cheek to cheek for two years. Uh, <laughs> and I love Barney Frank, who's still around. Maybe you know, he's always such a wit. And he always says, that's the only half-assed thing you did when you were in Congress. But I, I think probably I did more than that. Anyway, so it was, it was really quite an experience. And finally, in 96, I decided it was time. 24 years had been quite enough. My book was 24 years on housework and the place is still a mess. And it fits. It gets messier, it seems. Um, and then I went to Princeton to teach, as Ann told you, and was then head of the book publishers. And now I'm very, very happy to be part of the English-speaking union, which is very exciting. And I hope many of you, if you're not members, think about it. because. Um, there are these wonderful blossoming groups all over the world, and they really want to learn how to speak English. They would love to have you come. They love to have the books. They love to have dialogue. Um, as one of the people from one of those countries said, the sad part of this is they probably want to do it so they can leave the country, uh, but, but not necessarily. I mean, I think all business, everything else is being done in English, and um, it, it's just a wonderful thing to get involved in. And so I hope a lot of you find out more about it and, and, and do. Now where I live, I would have bet my firstborn that I would never live there. Um, so I'm glad I didn't. I'm not a betting person because I kind of like him and I wouldn't want to lose him. Uh, <clears throat> we now live in Celebration, Florida, which is Disney's experiment in new urbanism. And <laughs> the way we ended up there, was when I was at the uh, when I was at the Association of American Publishers, my father had lung cancer, and the doctors in Denver said you have to get him out of this altitude; it'll give him a year. So I was working in Washington, and my husband was working in Washington, and I was working in New York. Um, so we start that wonderful family dialogue, and Florida was the thing that made the most sense because we could get there on weekends. And they were like, hell no, we won't go. It's God's waiting room. It's flat. It's ugly. Uh, yeah, blah, blah. You know, I don't know if any of you had this wonderful experience, but suddenly you're the parents and they're the children, and it's really not pleasant. Um, 
And one day my father called me and said, I picked up the, the Wall Street Journal and I read about this new town Disney's doing. And if I have to live in Florida, I might live there because it's not gated and it's not just old people and so forth and so on. So I knew Michael Eisner. I called him. I said, I don't care what the house looks like. I don't even want to see it. I want a house. Get me a house. I got to have it now. It's life and death. So we did. I sent the kids down. I said, furnish the house. They did. We had my parents down there in a week. Um, and the rest is history. Uh, the, when my parents died, we got ready to sell the house. And the kids said, if you ever do, and we have grandchildren, we're going to tell them the once upon a time. I'm like, oh, that won't be cool. So here we are. Uh, it is it was really quite an amazing thing. If you ever come down, come visit, because I, we've got 55 miles of, of walks, fabulous hospital, walk to everything, you know, pools, the bit, everybody's got big old porches, and, you know, the cars are all back in the garages, and, you know, we pretend like we don't have cars, we have little electric, I mean, it's, it's but it's, it's really uh, been a fascinating experience. I never thought I'd end up being a communitarian, <laughs> and now I am one. It's terrific. But we miss Colorado and try to get to the mountains every summer. It is not a great place for summer. If summer, if we can use summer as a verb. Um, so that's kind of what, what has all happened. And now, um, I must say the things that trouble me the most as I look at the world, and then let's, we'll open this up and see what troubles you and if I have any input. I'm very troubled at the level of discourse and how it has degenerated. You know, people will say to me, yeah, but when you came, the issues weren't so tough. And I say, you know, when I came, I am really sorry. We had impeachment going on. That was a little tense. <laughs> and we, we had those hearings going on in the Judiciary Committee where everybody was locked up and we're reading this stuff and we're sitting there with headphones on and, you know, everything was really, really tense, and the Vietnam War. So Washington smelled like tear gas. We had National Guardsmen sleeping in the tunnels, connecting the, you know, the, so that they didn't come and take the place over. I said it was really tough. But we had a different kind of feeling. And that was during the day, you could argue like mad, but at night, you could sit down and have dinner together and talk about things. You understood that your positions, you know, and, and we argued on the facts. We didn't call each other names. We didn't, you know, if we didn't agree with someone, we'd say, well, now the way I look at it is this, and the way you look at it is that. But we didn't call them socialists or communists or, or something else or start any other kind of name calling. And I think we've now kind of changed it so it's more name calling and labeling and less factual debate, which is, is very troubling to me. And it's also, you can't compromise, because if you compromise, you capitulate it. Now, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I have always figured that I don't have a corner on truth. I change my mind all the time. I'm constantly learning on getting new facts. And, and when you get new facts, you kind of say, oh, yeah, well, if you add that to it, yeah, maybe it does look a little different. I mean, that's just how life is to me. So, of course, you're going to have to compromise a little bit. But this bit about, I know, and I'm not moving. And then there's the whole group in Congress who are very proud of the fact they don't even have passports. Because who would want to travel outside the United States? Well, uh, I think it's kind of important to see what's going on in the world. We absolutely are part of it, whether we want to be or not. And uh, that kind of troubles me, too. It reminds me of the period in our history when we had the know-nothings. You know, it's like, I don't really want to go back to that era if we can avoid it. But that all um, has been an, an interesting experience as to how we tone this down. People keep saying they don't like the negative ads, and yet they work. So as long as they work, you're going to see more. And uh, that's fascinating. Um, I went out to campaign this year for a lot of people. But I also went to Arizona for Gabby Giffords. And there was absolutely no question it was the most toxic environment I had seen. They had smashed the windows in her office. You know, they'd done all, there were people out there screaming all the time about Obamacare and, and how awful she was. And 
<laughs> she had a fundraiser. I gave my speech. I went out and I started talking to one woman and she said, don't talk to me. I'm a spy. I don't like people like you. And I'm like, okay, well, that's wonderful. But what, what kind of a thing was going on? So uh, I just came back uh, last week from doing a keynote for the sheriff out there who has just been under siege. The state shut off his money and everything else because he talked about the toxic atmosphere and how it did have something he thought it affected the, sh the shooting. And the idea of, is, of course, a normal person would not react to all of that negativism with a shooting. But unfortunately, society isn't made up of just normal people. And her opponent was running with guns in his posters, you know, and he had shooting matches <laughs> for fundraisers and all sorts of things. Um, and, you know, bullseyes, <laughs> which was really quite an interesting, strong message, we thought. So the civil society thing troubles me a lot. The war things trouble me a lot. When I picked up the paper and read that a pilot that we had cha trained shot eight of our people, I don't like that. And of course, last week they shot six. You know, what are we doing? Have we really figured that out? Do we really understand that region? Is this how we should be in that region? Uh, I don't hear us having that debate at all. It's like the whole thing about defense is just totally off budget. After that huge fight where they almost shut down the government, you know, fighting over the thing, what did they, they increase the defense budget? You know, more than Gates even asked for. <laughs> and so you're going to cut everything else, but you keep increasing that, even if they aren't even asking for it, we'll give it to them anyway. I, I don't understand why we're not mature enough to at least talk about it and say, what are we doing, and is it the right thing? Um, I worry tremendously about what's happening in education. Uh, I used to represent the textbook publishers, and so I really know what's going on around the world, because they're all stealing our college textbooks. They know what they are. They're golden. In India, they cut the following deal with our textbook people. They wanted the top of the line, not the old textbooks, but the new ones. So they created these little alcoves, or these little um, places, where you could print the textbook. They pay the publisher for the rights to the textbook. They print it. There are no taxes on anybody in that region that's printing the textbook. So they can get the textbook locally made, without any taxes, and to the kids as cheaply as possible. Because they want the PhD in physics books, the, you know, the astrophysics, the, the science, the everything. They're doing it. China's not so nice, they just steal it and put it, <laughs> put it out as theirs. Um, we're, we're constantly fighting that. But you see all these universities that are popping up and, and people out there really learning and, and working and thinking over here we're saying, well, you know, why fund public education? I went to a meeting in, in Orlando that I was very troubled by. They were talking about government mandated schooling and how, you know, you really shouldn't have government mandated schooling. That meant public schools. Huh? And maybe we should give people vouchers or we should pay them to teach the children at home. What? So there, there's a lot of that stirring around and um, they seem to be very organized and the rest of us don't seem to be as organized. And of course, as a woman, I worry a little bit about the backsliding I'm seeing on women. Um, I, I think there's been a tremendous amount of backsliding there and we, we made some gains, but the things we thought we had gained <laughs> turned out to be more like beachheads. <laughs> and if you don't keep working, you lose the beachhead. And I could go on and on about all the other things that I'm concerned about, but um, uh, somehow we have to get our sense of humor back too. I know when we were trying to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed in Colorado, which we did, by the way, unlike many states, and again, I thank Tennessee because you're the state that allowed me to vote with your vote here, so thank you, Tennessee. We, we, uh, we feminists all worship the, the young man in Tennessee's legislature who called his mother and she told him how to vote, um, <laughs> and he voted right. Uh, but 
we created a little group called Ladies Against Women. And whenever a real conservative anti-ERA guy would come to town, we would put on our little hats and our gloves and we would go, and aprons, and we would go and try and sit as close to the front as possible and cheer them on. And we had buttons that said, I'd rather be ironing, and 59 cents is enough, and whatever, you know. And they had no idea what to do with us, because uh, here we were, we weren't disrupting anything, but we were clearly mocking the whole thing. And I think that's been one of the problems that we haven't, used our sense of humor. We just, we get mad and we react back and then we just escalate it. But I think all of us need to do a lot of thinking on how we return the civility back. I almost worship at the feet of John Stewart and Stephen Colbert. And every time Stephen Colbert tells me he has been raised in Charleston, South Carolina, I am like, I can't flaming believe it. I can't believe anybody with your sense of humor was born in Charleston and raised in Charleston, South Carolina. And then I heard, was anybody watching that very moving night he had Andrew Young on? Did anybody see that? Because it really explained Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert's father was called in to run the biggest hospital in Charleston when Stephen was just a baby, I guess. And right after he got there, there was the second largest strike in the South of African Americans because there was this huge pay gap between African Americans and whites at this hospital. And it was a huge civil rights thing. And you know, the national press was there, everybody was all over the place, the, uh, and the town was split apart and the whole bit. And Andrew Young came in to say that his dad had had the guts to call the Southern Leadership Conference, and it was Andrew Young who became the point person who worked with his dad behind the scenes to quiet that whole thing and bring it down and work to a, an equitable solution that everybody could deal with, which was very moving. So you begin to think, okay, well that's the kind of family he came from, and it must have been really tough in that environment. I don't know how he hung on, but he hung on, and there he was. So, um, but, but they had taken the news and they, they kind of, deal with it the way I thought the regular news should be. But the regular news has kind of become, oh look, a squirrel's learned how to water ski. Oh look, if it bleeds, it leads. Oh look, you know, it's, you, know you get all done and you think, okay, that was news? <laughs> Not really. So um, here I am, as I say, feeling like an alien in my own culture some days, wondering what in the world has happened in this world, and what, did I miss something somewhere? <laughs> but it's still, an exciting and interesting time to be around, as they say in Chinese. I know I studied Chinese when I was in college, and I remember halfway through it thinking, oh, they think they're the middle kingdom, and we're a lot alike. We think we're the middle kingdom. And so I think that's why things like the ESU and, and people who travel and people who read, that's terribly important, because we really need a perspective outside of ourselves. It's, it's a huge world out there, and we're a very small part of it, and we really need to do everything we can to try and understand it and prepare our future generations for it. And we're not preparing them by cutting education, and we're not preparing them by cutting back on public education, and we're not preparing them by um, cutting out preschool or anything else. We ought to be doing everything we can to get those real things in their hands. So let me shut up at this point and see what kind of questions you have because we would love to do a Q&A. Somebody must have a question. I'm always happy when my husband is in here because he always has one and I never like the ones he has. <laughs> yes? You may not want to talk about the ESU in detail here, but what, what, what are the top two or three priorities hmm. for you at the ESU? Well, the top priorities are education, 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 you know. Um, we do several pieces there. I'm blessed in that when I leave here, I will be going to New York, and we're having our wonderful high school kids that won in each region come to perform in the Lincoln Center, their Shakespeare pieces. So imagine a high school kid coming, whoo, to the Lincoln Center, but this has gone on all over America and Mexico. I think we still have somebody from Mexico coming. Um, 
and they come and they compete against each other for who is the best, which is, which is really thrilling to see them on stage performing. We do a lot for teacher enrichment, and sending them overseas uh, to you know, exchanges, uh, doing teacher enrichment here. The poor teachers here, you know, hardly are getting any enrichment at all. Everybody's pounding on the teachers. Nobody ever realized what a tough thing it is. But, you know, seminars on how to teach Shakespeare, how to do different things. We started a new program. It's very exciting. It's in the middle schools. And, you know, I think only angels can work with middle school kids. They're very hard. But it's teaching them to debate. It's part of this civil society thing. You know, we've, we've really got to go back and learn how to debate. We've forgotten how to debate. Debate is not name calling. It's it's how do you do a debate where you are trying to meet head on on facts, um, and that's exciting. We do the book things. We do um, scholarships. We do you know there's there's a range of things, and some of our local groups do other uh, projects that you know aren't all. Not everybody does the same thing, and some help uh, new Americans speak English better or teach them um, some, uh, you know, there's just lots and lots of different things that, that can be done in that auspices. So it, I, I think it's very exciting that somebody's trying to help the public schools <laughs> in all of these areas, uh, learning English heritage, the English language, Shakespeare, history, literature, tradition, debating, that's all very good. So we hope that you get interested and uh, we'd love to have you participate. Anybody else got a question? I see someone over here with a 1988 presidential button. How in the world did you find that? I have it. <laughs> I couldn't I believe it. You oh my gosh, how nice of you. Well, thank you. Did you live in Colorado? No. Oh my gosh, yes, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. That was a crazy one. Remember that? Yes, oh we my were. goodness. Yes, we were. We were so full of ourselves, we thought we would take the world. Yes, we did. And then we met the world. <laughs> <laughs> and realized that up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they weren't they weren't gonna let us do it. But it was an interesting time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the problems I see, and I don't know about Tennessee, but I know a lot about Colorado and uh, other places. Colorado's lucky because we have a constitutional amendment and we can do balanced districts. But the redistricting thing is a nightmare, I think. And it's gotten, computers have made it worse and worse because the computers can draw districts where literally a yellow dog can win as a Democrat or a yellow dog can win as a Republican. You know, it, do, it doesn't matter. They can make all Republican districts or all Democratic districts. When I first went there, we didn't have computers and the districts were a lot more mixed up. Uh, and as I say, in my state it insists that it's mixed up, but most states don't. So it allows the legislature to draw these districts that are very heavily in one party or the other. Now, if you are an elected official from the heavily Republican Party or, or district or a heavily Democratic district, your fear is not the general election. General election is nothing. That election in November, forget it, you know, because you're just going to win. Your fear is the primary. Primary voters are usually many fewer than the general election. And the extremes in both parties tend to come out for the primary. So if you look at Republicans, they're terrified of Tea Party people coming out. I mean, look at Bennett losing in, in Utah. I mean, that was unheard of. He's committee chairman, he's very esteemed, Mormon, been there forever, you know, nice guy. 
Nobody would consider him a radical except the people who went out and voted against him, you know. Uh, and, and others, if you remember, there was a series of people who got uh, dumped in their primaries. The Democrats fear real uh, people to far to the left uh, coming out against them. I will never forget Tip O'Neill coming back once from Bella Abzug's district and saying, oh my God, Bella's to the right of her district. <laughs> <laughs> All these people who came to the meeting were yelling at her. She wasn't doing enough here and wasn't doing enough there. So I think what has happened is that has pulled the Congress much further apart. Now, when you get to the Senate, they can't change the boundaries. You got to run in the state. And so obviously you can't draw a state that's all one or all the other. Um, and so the Senate tends to look at it a little differently. But the House has become much more polarized. The other thing I think that has really uh, makes me crazy about what's happened with politics is this money thing. Um, and the Supreme Court just keeps feeding it more and more. Uh, as a lawyer, I wish I could have argued that case. Because as you know, when you appear in front of the Supreme Court, they give you so many minutes. And that's it. Now, when we would try to sit, put any kind of limits on how much time you could buy on television or anything else, oh, no, no, that's interfering with free speech. So I don't know why the lawyer that argued the case didn't pull out his wallet and say, you know, you're interfering with my free speech. What's it going to cost to get another 10 minutes? You know? because I want to buy another 10 minutes. And the Supreme Court would have thrown him out on his ear, of course. But somehow their rules don't interfere with free speech. But in the campaign area, if you try to put any limits on, you're doing free speech. So what happens is you've got every member getting up every day, and they have a number in their head. And that number is what their campaign manager tells them they got to raise that day. And so they spend the day on the phone dialing for dollars, and they can't do it in the office. They have to go across the street to all of those little cubby holes. Well, uh, you know, uh, people don't give you five or ten thousand dollars because they believe in good government. <laughs> oh, I mean, what can I tell you? They, they give you five or ten thousand dollars because they want you to do X, Y, or Z. So you, they have you have filled up your card by the time. <laughs> You don't have time to legislate on anything else. It's like, please do this if. My biggest shock when I was on armed services, we did a terrible thing. Uh, uh, again, I'm sure they thought that I, I just, it was like I was wearing a bathing suit to church every day. But as you know, the House passes a bill, the Senate passes a bill, they go, go to conference to work it out. Now, the conferees are selected by the chairman and they're usually a very elite senior group. So this younger freshman and I on the Armed Services Committee decided something was always happening in the conference. We've got another whole bill back that we, you know, where did this come from? So we decided we'd go to the conference. So we'd walk into the conference and they were gonna call a sergeant at arms to take us out and we said, okay, but we're members of Congress, so how can you do that? This is, you know, well, and of course the sergeant at arms agreed with us and they were very upset, so we watched it. Literally, this is how they were marking it up. How many, you know, F-14s are you gonna win? Well, how many tickets did they buy to your fundraiser? And how many to yours? Yeah, and how many to yours? And, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you should buy F-14s that they say they need, <laughs> not <laughs> on the basis of how many tickets they bought to your fundraiser, yeah. Now, I, I mean, that is the worst possible outcome, I think. But that's the kind of stuff that you could see happening because of this total push to get money all the time. And it gets more and more expensive. My first race was $7.50. That was my average campaign contribution. When I left, it was $32. But very few people can say that, you know? I mean, I was just lucky. I had a nice, tight district, Denver, Colorado, and everybody knew who I was, so I didn't spend any money. But most people, get caught in these TV and radio things and on and on and on. It doesn't, yeah? What do I think about next? 
Well, if I can tell you my personal life, um, my daughter and son-in-law, who is a professor at uh, Montana State, he is on sabbatical, and they are living with us right now while he's on sabbatical at the University of Florida with their four-year-old and their six-year-old. So most of all, I'm thinking about July when I get my house back. <laughs> And uh, a little more sanity returns to my life. I can hardly think at this point. Um, in fact, uh, I got so confused I came here a day early. I mean, I'm like, oh, I'm living in total chaos. I feel like I'm living in a hurricane. But what would I like? I really want to find something that I, I am on the board of the Margaret Casey Foundation, and we work with the poorest of the poor in this country. And one of the things that troubles me tremendously is while we go into these places overseas where we're seeing all this dissension in you know, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, they're all saying, yeah, well, who can be upset? I mean, 1% of the population controls all the wealth, right? Well, hello, <laughs> if you look what's going on over here, it's like a mirror image. And that tremendous inequality is amazing. So we are working really hard with uh, down on the border uh, and, and those areas in, um, um, with the migrant workers, with all sorts of people who have very, very tough lives. So the Immokalee workers, I don't know if you've heard of them, but we've worked really hard with them and with others. So I really do enjoy that. And obviously, um, domestic violence, worries me a lot. I still am very concerned in working with shelters on that and those kind of things. I, I, there's just an awful lot of people left behind. I have a little story about celebration that the realtors would absolutely kill me if they knew I was telling because they don't want this story told, but it's a wonderful story. Across the highway from us were a bunch of hotels um, and we had lots of homeless people in Florida. Maybe you've seen. It's, been, it's really been hit harder than almost any state. So the county bought the hotels and put homeless people in them. So they started putting them in our schools in celebration, and we had a few people going nuts, and they moved or put their kids in private schools. But the rest of the community raised $32 million and said, we're going to make this work. And last year, the valedictorian of the high school um, was one of these kids. This year, the high school made national news because they elected a kid with autism as their king for homecoming. Never been done. Um, these kids are all into it, you know, and they're, they're excited about it. They all voted to go into uniforms, so you couldn't tell who was who. Uh, people, then part of the money went to get uniforms for the kids and get them back and forth and stuff. Uh, I, I really do think basically Americans have good hearts and want to try these things, but so I've, I've been excited about this communitarian thing that's going on in celebration. The, the first time I saw that happen, we didn't have a church. The, the church was meeting in the, in the uh, movie theater. And they had raised the money, and, and Disney had given them the land for the church. And they're getting ready. They're having a meeting to uh, decide what architect they're going to hire and all this. You know how that game goes. Meanwhile, there had been a, a, like a hurricane or a tornado go through a a trailer park not far away and destroyed a lot of homes and stuff. It was really ugly. And within 10 minutes of the meeting, a guy stood up and said, this is obscene. What are we talking about building a church when these people don't have homes? We gotta give this money to them. What are you crazy? And somebody seconded the motion. The meeting was over in 10 minutes. And I thought, as a politician, I've never seen this. All I've seen is the greedy give me, give me, give me. Um, so I decided, okay, that's where I'm going to live. Yeah. Now, the realtors never want that story told because they say if people think that you're welcoming homeless in here, the property values will drop. <laughs> so it's a fascinating discussion. <laughs> but it, it, that's something I've spent a lot of time on, and I really do enjoy it. You know, because I just, I guess it's still politics, but I, I keep trying to find the good in people. And I think we're probably done. I'm <laughs> seeing Nan looking at her watch. Are we not? OK. Do we have another question then? If we don't, we'll let you all go have some snacks. Terrific. Yes, there's one. Um, if you wear a button, you get to ask too. No. 
Well, it's a very hard court. I mean, Justice Kennedy is the balance constantly. Um, and I feel like, you know, I have to send him flowers and chocolates and court him 24 hours a day. I, I, I don't know what you do. Uh, and he gets a lot of pressure. I am very worried because right now we are seeing state legislatures pass things that are unbelievable. I mean, they're unconstitutional. They're unbelievable. They're all over the place. But I just don't know what the Supreme Court's going to do. I was astounded when they came down saying, you know, all of these companies <laughs> could give money to these groups and they could come into the political thing and you didn't have to disclose who gave the money and on and on and on. So you kind of think, well, if they'll go there, where else will they go? Uh, and you're absolutely right. And one of the big problems is people just don't show up. I mean. If you look at our state of Florida, I, I can't even believe it. We've got a governor that should be in prison, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Rick Scott, you know, a billion seven is the, is the fine for Medicare, Medicaid for a billion seven? He takes the fifth 57 times and he's living in the governor's mansion. I said, this is new political financing or campaigns. You steal it from the people you pay the little fine, then you use all this money, you campaign, and you're back in the public trough again. I mean, it's, it's, it's frightening to me. Uh, but it worked. So uh, people have got to understand their votes count. And when you look at Florida, 60% of the Republicans voted and 48% of the Democrats. So uh, they, they don't seem to get the idea that elections matter and these, these nominees matter. And, uh, oh. but I am happy. I think we've got a couple good appointments on there. I used to want mandatory life support systems for, <laughs> for Justice Ginsburg, every time I see her, I would go over and have cookies and tea with her, and I think if the wind comes through here, she's going to blow away. She's just, I really worry about her. And I'm really sad that Justice O'Connor gave up her seat. That's, you know, she, she had a very level head on her, and, uh, um, and I'm very sad. As you know, I led the march over to the Senate, during the Anita Hill slash Clarence, um, <laughs> and we got Clarence. <laughs> so, yeah, it worries me too, and I just don't know what you do to educate Americans about that. I mean, we talk about it, but the people just don't get it. It's one step removed. I sometimes wonder if they're teaching civics anymore, um, and I don't think they are, because people just plain don't understand how this government works. Uh, and. You know, Jefferson used to say education's more important than anything else. When you've got elected members of Congress talking about how Jefferson was against indebtedness, and excuse me, his debt was so big, that's how we started the Library of Congress. He had to sell his books to the government to pay his debt. So I think he was for... <laughs> and, you know, we hear that the Founding Fathers were working against slavery. It's like, really? <laughs> you know? 
So I don't think we know our history, and I don't think we know our uh, uh, anything much about civics and how government works, and that's very troubling. Thank you very much, and thank you, Dean. It was wonderful to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I would like before, just before the reception for just a moment, uh, you heard about uh, Patricia Schroeder's incredible, effective congressional career where uh, she was such an advocate for women's rights. And if she will give us permission, we would very much like to commemorate your visit to Vanderbilt with a volume for our special collections. We are recommending for rent one pedestal, which is a book of fiction. It's a fictional account of day-to-day -day life of a suffrage worker going door-to-door -door and rolling suffrage supporters, making speeches, demonstrating lobbying politicians, and traveling on behalf of the cause. The book depicts the intelligence and good humor of suffragettes and their dedication to their cause at, uh, and their intensified efforts that was uh, to succeed in New York uh, in the referendum in 1917. Author Marjorie Schuler was a national American Women's Suffrage Association's chairman of publicity and a second generation suffragette. Her work and the work of others like her led to the passage of the Women's Suffrage Amendment in 1919, the amendment was ratified by the 36th state that you mentioned earlier for inclusion in the federal constitution. Would you give us permission to add this in your honor? I would be so delighted. Thank you very much. I, I certainly hope all of you will stay and spend some time uh, at our reception and have a chance to uh, uh, talk some more about the things that uh, were brought up today that are important issues. Thank you for coming. Thank you.